If you've got a Bible with you, if you want to turn with me to the book of Exodus, chapter 33 and verse 7. One of the things that I do appreciate when I get to preach is that I get to choose my own passage. I got properly stitched up last week in terms of reading the passage out. I gave Zoe one passage to preach on and she wanted the whole Bible read out, it seemed like. So I'm going to go the other way this week and just read out a few short verses from the Bible, beginning at verse 7 of Exodus 33 this morning. And this is what it says. Now Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away, calling it the tent of meeting. Anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people rose and stood at the entrance to their tents, watching Moses until he entered it. As Moses went into the tent, the pillar of clouds would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke to Moses. Whenever the people saw the pillar of clouds standing at the entrance to the tent, they all stood up and worshipped, each at the entrance to their own tent. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young aide, Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. Let's pray. Father God, as we open up your word today and we think about what it means to have an intimate relationship with you, Lord, my heart and my prayer this morning is that each and every one of us would draw close to you this morning. Lord, for those who know you well and for those who maybe don't know you at all, Lord, may this be a holy moment this morning where we draw close to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we're continuing our sermon series called The Journey, looking at the significant journeys that we see throughout Scripture and seeing how God moved in those journeys and looking at what God wants to teach us here today through those journeys that we see in the Bible as we consider our own journey here at Hope Baptist Church together and maybe where God might be taking us over the course of the next few months and years and what that might look like. And with that in mind, today we're focusing on a young man named Joshua and beginning to think of his journey. If you know anything about the Bible, perhaps when you hear the name Joshua, your first thought is of Joshua leading a group of people marching around the walls of Jericho and seeing God do the miraculous in that moment and bringing those walls down and the people of Israel entering the promised lands. Maybe you might have thought of that time where Joshua praised this big, bold, audacious prayer, asking God to make the sun in the sky stand still, and then God answers his prayer. But when you think of Joshua, that's not where we are going to go today. I want to take us maybe to a place where you wouldn't expect us to go Because I wonder how many of us know when we're thinking about a journey, often it's the preparation of that journey which is just as important as the journey itself. By nature, I am quite a spontaneous person. I have no problem just getting in my car and driving and just seeing where I end up. And I tell you, some of the best adventures that you can go on are when you just go and see what happens. But here's the thing, they can also lead to disaster as well. Where actually going against my nature at times and thinking things through, working out a route, working out what I might need, the food that I might want, the clothes that I might need to wear, doesn't always lead to a great trip. But it adds to the likelihood, at least, of things going well along the way. And in the same way, Before we get to those incredible stories and those incredible parts of Joshua's life where he sees the miraculous happen, there are a number of other times in scripture where we see him pop up. And I believe it's in those moments that God prepares Joshua for what is to come. The reality is, sometimes in life we will have to go through trials and tests in order for God to mould us and shape us into the person that he is calling us to be. Joshua 
would have been born in slavery in Egypt under the cruel oppression of the Egyptians. Joshua had a tough start in life. And even in the midst of that, God used him and God shaped him to be the great man of God that we see in Scripture. I want to tell you today that it doesn't matter what your start in life was. Your start in life does not have to affect your ultimate destination. You may have been abandoned as a child. You may have been treated cruelly and you may have even been abused. But if you allow God in and you allow God to, he will set you free from your past and give you a new direction. God, the God of heaven, the God that we are here to worship today will change and transform your life if you allow him in. The labels that maybe you have been given in the past don't have to affect you anymore. But God can shape you and give you a new identity, give you a future and a fresh vision for your life if you only turn to him and seek him. And I want to pick up today this incredible account of this man Joshua found in the book of Exodus. In many ways, this is an account which is not about Joshua at all. In fact, the mention of him here could be seen as nothing more than simply an add-on. But what I want us to grasp today is that actually it's in the intimate that God has the ability to change and transform our lives So let me give you a little bit of background about what's going on here. The Israelites had just come out of Egypt. God had performed the miraculous signs and wonders, leading them through the Red Sea on dry ground, as we heard about last week. And Moses, Israel's leader at the time, he goes off to meet God on Mount Sinai, where God gives him the Ten Commandments. Now, Moses is up a mountain for a considerable amount of time. So much so that the people quickly forget about everything God has done. And they're like, where's this Moses guy gone? He's, he's late. We're waiting and he's not come back. So they go to a man called Aaron and they say, we don't know what's happened to Moses. And we can't wait around for him forever. So this is what we're going to do, Aaron. We're going to bring you all of our gold and we want you to make us a cow. And when you make us a cow, we're going to worship this cow and that cow will be our gods. And that's what happens. And Moses, he eventually comes down from the mountain and he is angry with what he sees and God is angry too. And God is ready to wipe the people totally off the face of the earth for their rebellion. But Moses pleads on their behalf and God relents. And then he intercedes for the people again, acknowledging that the people's guilt and asking God to forgive them. And God does forgive them, but he tells them that he's not going to go with them because he might consume them with his wrath if he does. The people, they're currently in the wilderness, and as a result of what God has said, Moses pitches a tent just outside the camp, and it becomes known as the tent of meeting because everyone who sought the Lord would go up to that place. And what we see today from our scripture is a special relationship that Moses has with God. You see, every time Moses would go out to that tent, all the people would rise up and stand at their tent doors and watch what is about to happen. And Moses would go in and a pillar of cloud would come down and stand at the entrance of the tent door and God would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. And the people at this point, they would just stand up and they would worship God because they knew that in that moment, God was in their midst. But like I said, this is not a sermon about Moses today. If you want to hear a cracking sermon about Moses, go back to last week and listen to last week's when Zoe preached. This is a sermon today about Joshua. Joshua, the son of young, uh, Nun, a young man who would not leave the tents. Moses would go in, everyone would watch, and then they would depart, except Joshua. This is what we read. Thus the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And when Moses turned again into the camp, his assistant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. Moses would go in, 
a visible sign of God's presence would come and the people were in awe every time this happened and they would start to worship God. And when Moses would depart from the tent, the people went, that was great, we're going to go back to our daily lives now and get on with everything that we need to do. Except this one man, Joshua, who even after everyone else had gone, would not depart from where he was because he was so hungry for God. He wanted to be in the presence of God constantly. The success that Joshua experienced later in his life simply didn't happen by chance. The faith that Joshua had to pray that the sun in the sky would stand still didn't just come to him all of a sudden. It was born in moments like this. Those moments where he was so desperate for God to show up in his life that it didn't bother him to put his life on hold to seek it. He wasn't concerned about the monotonous day-to-day experience of life and the existence that he had. He didn't worry about where his next meal was coming from. He wanted God. He just wanted God. He wanted more. Joshua not only wanted to witness the mighty acts of God. He wanted to hear from God himself. Moses had been talking to God as one does to a friend. And that's what Joshua was desperate for. People often wonder, don't they, why we don't see God move in this day and age as much as we see him move in the Bible. I wonder if it's partly because we've eradicated our needs for God in the Western world. Unlike Joshua, we would rather go about our daily routines and our daily lives instead of seeking his presence. We find ourselves so wrapped up in the burdens and the stresses of 21st century living in the West that we simply don't have time for God. Sure, we'll go to church occasionally and we'll do the God bit when we can fit it in, but even then sometimes chores come up that we need to do and other things come up in our life that just can't wait. And we're a little bit too tired so we just don't bother. And then we wonder why we don't see the power of God in the same ways today. Does God still move like he did in biblical times? Yes, absolutely. You can go to countries around this world where people literally see God move in the miraculous on a day-to-day basis because they need to rely on him to survive. You can go to countries around this world where praying the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread, really means, Lord, if you don't come through for me today, I'm going to die. And they see God move in miraculous and powerful ways. But yet for us in the 21st century West, we've more or less eradicated the need for God. And I believe that at times God honours that. You see, the Bible says, draw close to God and he will draw close to you. So there's an onus on us here. God will draw as close to us as we allow him to draw. If we want the mountaintop experiences of God if we want to see God move in power in our day and age and in our generation, it starts with doing exactly what Joshua did and seeking intimacy with a God who wants to draw near to you. So what does intimacy with God actually look like? Well, with any kind of intimacy in any relationship, you cannot be intimate with a person unless you trust them. And what's true of our human relationships is also true of our relationship with God. That's why the Bible tells us to trust in the Lord with all of our heart, lean not on our own understanding, and in all of our ways acknowledge him, and he will direct our path. The common mistake when it comes to thinking about intimacy with God is that we wrongfully assume that intimacy with God comes through simply acquiring knowledge of him. You see it in our churches today, don't you? We have so much theological knowledge available at our fingertips, it's unreal. We have hundreds and hundreds of Bibles in hundreds of different languages. I'm sure many of us have got bookshelves full of Christian literature. We can watch sermons 24-7 on our TV and internet. And these things are great, but the church is not abounding in people who are walking close and experiencing the intimacy of God. Why? Because knowledge alone does not lead to trust. That's why Jesus said this to the religious leaders of the day in John 5, verse 39 and 40. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you will have eternal life. 
and it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. When all we have is knowledge of God, it doesn't build trust, it builds pride. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 8, now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Another common mistake when we think about intimacy with God is that we try to achieve intimacy with God through aesthetic experiences and different churches will do this in different ways for example if you were to go to a high church you would find a load of bells and smells in order to try to create intimacy with God they might have a building which will look a certain way in order to try to draw close to him you can go to contemporary churches and if they have a band which plays certain songs in a certain way if there's good light Lighting, in some churches even a smoke machine those are the things which might draw us close to God and produce intimacy with him but that's not the case think about it like this a candle lit romantic dinner may encourage a sweet moment of intimacy between a couple but all the environment actually does is increase the mutual trust and love which is already there if that same couple go for a meal with a lack of trust and a lack of love it doesn't matter how good the music is or how nice the candles are or how sweet the food tastes it's not going to achieve intimacy the aesthetics don't have the power to do that only restoring trust in the relationship will ever do that And the key to drawing close to God is to put our trust today in the Lord Jesus. Because it's only through Jesus that we can have intimacy with God. Hebrews 4, 14 says this, Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then draw close with confidence to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Jesus has made it possible for us to have an intimate relationship with God. You see, we have no right to one. But because Jesus came and he lived the life that we should have lived and he died a death on a cross that we deserved and he rose again, because of that we have been made right with God. He has made a way. And not only can we draw close to God today, we can draw close to God with confidence. The truth is this, God is not impressed with our feet he's impressed with our faith he's not impressed with the quantity of our our knowledge now don't mishear me I'm not saying knowledge is not important we should seek to find out as much as we can about God as we can but it alone does not bring intimacy with God God is not impressed with our aesthetic events but when God sees a heart which fully trusts his promises and earnestly seeks to live for him that is where intimacy with God is born. John 14, 21 says this, Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by the Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. The invitation to intimacy today is open to you and to me. Jesus has done all the hard work which makes it possible. What it requires is belief in him and a deep-rooted trust and a desire above everything else in our lives to know him more. Intimacy with God occurs in the places that we learn to trust him the most. Let me say that again because it's important for us to understand. Intimacy with God occurs in those places in our lives where we begin to trust him the most. For Joshua, his desire was to know God and his desire to linger in his presence, forsaking everything else meant that intimacy came. 
And because that intimacy was there and that trust was there, it meant that when he and 11 other spies went in to spy out the promised land, you can read about it in Numbers 13 for yourself, when they went to see what was before them and what tasks they had to accomplish, when the scale was made known to them and all of the other spies except one said, this task is too big for us, Joshua turned round and said, we can go and we can do it, for the Lord is on our side. For Joshua, it meant that when Moses, the great leader of Israel, died, Joshua was chosen to be his successor. And when Joshua did become leader of Israel, he heard these words spoken to him from God. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Be careful to do everything written in it. You know, when Joshua heard those words spoken to him in the book of Joshua, I don't think that this was the first time that Joshua heard these words. These wouldn't have been new words to him. This was a familiar voice. This was a voice that he had heard many times before. The law was in Joshua's heart. He had been listening. He didn't have some sort of hand-me-down faith. This was no second-hand blessing. And as a result, he was able to move forward with faith and with courage because Joshua didn't leave the tent. So that leaves us to ask the question today, how much of God do we really want? I mean, how much of God do we really want? Because the same God who met with Moses in the tent and spoke to him as one speaks to a friend, the same God who showed up and met with Joshua and meant that he didn't want to leave from his presence is here today. He's here right now. And we have a choice. Will we simply leave this place in a short while's time and get on with our lives and get on with the busyness and the hectic things that we have to do, fulfilling our to-do list and just going about what we need to do? Or will today we choose to linger in the presence of God and say, God, this morning I just want to be near you. And like Joshua, I'll do whatever it takes. Because it's when we're in that place that I believe God moulds us and he prepares us for what's to come. And as we consider our journey right now, individually and as a church, as we begin to talk together over the coming weeks about where God might be leading us and what God might be calling us to do together as a church, my hope and my prayer is that your heart will be filled with excitement for what God has for us here in this place and what he might want to do with us in the midst of it all. But here's the thing, it might lead us to being a little bit uncertain at times too. It might lead us to ask the question, how on earth are we going to do this? How on earth are we going to afford this? How on earth are we going to pull this off? The dreams that I hope that we dream together are so big that they can only be accomplished when God is in our midst. And if the lesson that we learn from Joshua's journey today is simple, it's the presence of God which produces intimacy, which allows us to do the things that God calls us to do then we have to learn that lesson together as a church. And this is where it starts, by actively choosing not to leave the tent, by seeking his face above everything, choosing to intentionally draw close to him. Often, if a journey is going to be successful, it requires a little bit of pre-planning. And as we seek to be bold in whatever God calls us to do, Let us choose today to be lost in wonder, love and praise. I'm going to invite you to stand if you're able and invite the band to come back up.
And today I've preached a little bit earlier because again, I want to allow some time for what the Holy Spirit might want to do among us here in this place today. And I want us, as a church, where we are at and where we feel able to make a stand today and choose not to leave the tent and see what God might want to do in our midst this morning. So in a moment, we're going to sing. And then after that, we're going to respond where we can and where we want to this morning. So why don't we just take a moment in the silence before we lift our voices to invite God to come here in this place. As with last week, you may find it helpful just to adopt a posture of receiving by placing your hands out in front of you. And if that's something you want to do and you're comfortable doing that, we're going to wait on the Lord and ask him to come. God, forgive us for the times where we rush. Forgive us for the times where our diaries are just so busy and our lives are just so full that we don't linger in your presence. Lord God, may this be a significant morning here at Hope Baptist Church for us as a church and for us as individuals today where we draw close to a God who wants a relationship with us. May this be a morning of preparation for what is to come. May the big dreams that you're going to give us and the bold things that you'll call us to do fill our hearts with excitement rather than dread. May we be strong and courageous, just like Joshua. For the Lord is with us.